Welcome everyone to episode 1B of the Phoenix Report. I'm Jack Connor. Now, I say episode 1B because I'm technically not counting the uh, the preview slash intro episode, which was which was really just me talking by myself about myself, kind of introducing myself to you, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, so, if you don't know me and you're listening to this, you might want to go back and listen to that one first. Well, anyways, so te- so technically, I'm counting this as my first official episode, hence the name Episode 1B. And for my first episode, I wanted to talk to the guy who really encouraged me and helped me get into the podcasting world really more than anyone else. This is a guy I've known for nearly eight years. Now, I'll um, to give you a little context, I'm going to provide a little history here. Back in the summer of 2007, I joined a band called WMP, which I think stood for Words, Music, Percussion, or Weapons of Mass Production. The, uh, <laughs> the name of the band wasn't, wasn't really clear, but it had those three letters, WMP. Well, anyways, the guys in that band at the time were uh, Justin Cully on guitar, Kyle McDowell on drums, and J.C. Milam on lead vocals. They needed a bass player. Now, the band, as I had understood it, had been around for a couple years before then. Justin and Kyle, especially, had been playing together more or less exclusively since they were about 10 years old. Now, whenever you join a band that has already been together for a while, it it can be a bit of a scary thing because you want to make sure that you fit into what they're doing. You want to make sure you do the older material justice, you know, learn all their older songs and that sort of thing, and... You know, and, you know, there's a bit of a learning curve, especially if you're joining a band that's already been around for a little bit. Now, I personally have never had a problem with that because I've always felt just because you're not in a band from the start doesn't mean you can't add something to it later on or at least develop sort of a new chemistry or dynamic within the band. Now, what I didn't expect was to not only meet the guy who I replaced in the band, but I ended up becoming really good friends with this guy. Corey Wilson had been friends with Justin and Kyle since they were in high school, and together they had formed the band WMP. Now, to be honest, I don't remember the exact details about why their original split had occurred in the first place, uh, but I do know that Corey had been the original bass player for WMP, and his influence in that band would eventually have a direct impact on the band that would eventually splinter off from WMP, a band called Impatient Nation, that I ended up singing for. Um, The lineup of that band was myself on lead vocals, Justin on guitar, Kyle on drums, uh, their friend Matt Raspo on keyboards. Uh, Matt, coincidentally, was also in WMP for a little bit. And uh, and my college buddy, Casey Crisman, on bass. Now, Corey... Corey had already moved away to Tennessee by that point, but he was still very much like sort of the the unofficial sixth member of the band because they were songs that he and Justin and Kyle wrote together that that we had still managed to use all throughout Impatient Nation. So, I mean, his influence was directly felt, you know, through the band, all through, you know, through all the various incarnations. These days, Corey and Justin still collaborate on their newest venture, Chronocore.com which is a one-stop multimedia destination that serves as a vehicle for new music they compose together. Their music is used for a variety of purposes, and it blends styles ranging from hip-hop, EDM, 8-bit chiptunes, acoustic, rock, and, and, and many other genres. And not only that, Chronocord, by way of YouTube, has become a generator of quality podcast content covering sports, pro wrestling, movie and video game reviews, all sorts of things. Now, he currently resides in Oliver Springs, Tennessee, and without any further ado, I want to introduce a longtime musician, an up-and-coming producer, engineer, composer, songwriter, podcaster. He is a man of many talents, and he is one of my best friends, Corey C. Dub Wilson. What's up, Jack? Thank you so much for that uh, very, very kind and generous introduction you gave me. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to live up to all that, but let's see. Oh, bro, I I meant every word, and there was a reason why I wanted to have you as my first official guest on this thing, because really, you were the one who kind of showed me how to to do this thing in terms of getting the right mics, getting the right software. I knew nothing about it, and I, I mean... 
obviously you and I've been friends for a long time, but I was really a fan of of what you've been doing on Chrono Chord. So it just it made sense. Well, thanks a lot, man. I definitely appreciate that, and I consider it an honor to uh, to be able to inspire you to use podcasting and YouTube and whatever other avenues you may choose as a creative outlet. And hopefully, uh, hopefully everything works out here, and you get some fantastic shows. I know you've got a lot of great stuff planned, upcoming episodes. Man. Yeah, well, where... you, know, you know, it's one of those things, man, because, you know, it, it's funny. Sometimes it takes things like this, and, and, I mean, you and I talk all the time, but I, there are so many people I would love to have on this thing that, like, I, I don't really get to have, like, real in-depth conversations with. I mean, sometimes it's a phone call or a text or, like, a, hey, how you doing? But something like this is uh, it's a little more intimate in a way. And, you know, and it's like I said earlier, that's, you know, podcasting is really like the new blog, like the new personal journal. It's really like it becomes extensions of people's personalities. And, uh, and I like to talk and, uh, and I hope people like to listen. Absolutely. I know, uh, I certainly enjoyed that introduction and, uh, I'm really looking forward to, uh, what all you're going to have going here, man. I think you've, you've got some great ideas and you're going to bring your own spin to the excellent uh, outlet that is podcasting these days. I mean, let's face it, we live in a content-driven society and uh, ADD society, if you will, and there's a ton of content out there, but it's hard to find good stuff to consume as a viewer of entertainment, and uh, I'm certain that right here on the Phoenix Report, it's going to be pretty awesome. Oh, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. But uh, but a little, little, now let's talk about you for a little bit. Now uh, now see if you can give us some personal history. I mean I I know your personal history, but but what really got you started in music? Like what what you know what made you start playing bass? Or was bass even your first instrument? Or no no actually I I started out on uh, the conventional six string guitar. Um, as far as my inspirations on really getting into music, I always grew up a fan of all kinds of different stuff. Uh, everything from hip hop to, uh, grunge rock. I mean, pretty much everything that the 90s had, uh, growing up as a child of the 90s. I certainly soaked up all of those influences as well as the ones that I got from my parents' generation. A little bit older stuff. And, uh, Eventually, I just I got to my teenage years, and I felt that I really needed a creative outlet of some sort, something to spend my time doing that would be productive and that I would enjoy and that uh, might even be kind of cool uh, to other people. And that's pretty much what led me to playing guitar. I soon realized, however, that I was gifted with bass player fingers. Um, I am, even to this day, a serviceable rhythm guitarist, but uh, my definite talent came out once I started to play the bass, and that's where I am today. Currently, I'm uh, taking up piano as well as some other uh, other instruments to add to my arsenal. Very cool. I mean, it's... It's definitely, I mean, as you get older, it's tougher to learn, like, new stuff. I mean, I find it's just, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of having the discipline to go out there and do it. But um, but as far as uh, starting off on guitar and then switching to bass, uh, I mean, that's th that I always find interesting because it seems like, it seems like bass players are always the hardest people to find, especially when you're starting a new band or, you know, I, I think because... You know, especially in rock music, guitar is so up front and, and so in your face, where bass, I, I don't want to say taking a backseat, but, but isn't necessarily in the forefront of everyone's mind. Still very important, obviously. But, um, you know, what, what, what was it? I mean, did you think it, you just felt, um, I'm trying to think of the words to say. Did you, did you feel more comfortable playing bass as playing guitar? You said it was your fingers. Yeah, I mean, um, I kind of noticed about two years into playing guitar, once I started to get good enough to where I was confident enough to actually play in front of people who weren't musicians, mm -hmm. um, like Justin and Kyle, um, I just kind of noticed um, that I really wasn't 
going forward with it, and I wasn't gaining any ground, so I thought, well, you know, I could always play bass. And, of course, it just so happened, uh, with Justin being a guitarist, a hell of a guitarist at that, I mean, growing up and knowing that that was going to be the guy that I was going to be in a band with, why bother playing guitar and learning to play guitar whenever you only need one guitarist who's that talented? And uh, there was a need for a bass player after uh, the previous guy that Justin and Kyle had grown up jamming with sort of moved away from playing the instrument. And I just kind of swooped in there and took that spot. And uh, I've been happy to be the bass player ever since. You know... Just to kind of touch on the whole thing, I feel like more people want to be the next Jimi Hendrix than want to be the next Getty Lee. I mean, it's just, there's something about guitar players and lead singers. Maybe it's, maybe some of the female listeners here of the Phoenix Report could cash in on this and uh, let us know their opinion. But something about it, man, it's just, I guess society thinks it's cooler to be a guitarist or a lead singer than it is to be a bass player, or even perhaps a drummer. So, um, But hey, to me, I take pride in holding down the low end of a band. There's so much you can add as a bass player, man. It's, it's really insane. Um, there's so many different approaches you can take to it and styles, not only uh, with tonality, but, I mean, just the way you play and how you express yourself. Uh, I definitely love playing bass guitar as i know you do as well absolutely i mean you know it's funny touching on what you said earlier how it's like it always seems to be like the instrument people pick by default like i i know when i was first coming up it's like none none of my friends played bass and i kind of assumed that like well you know i i mean i yeah i did play cello when i was younger but like i assumed like oh the, this will probably be easier to learn and you know <laughs> i didn't realize of course that there was so much more to it than that yeah, and, definitely. Uh, and, you know, it's funny what you say about um, about the ladies maybe preferring uh, preferring the the singers or guitar players. I don't know if that's you know uniformly true across the board. I think you know, but I mean, I think it kind of goes back to my point where it's like you look at Aerosmith for example. Everyone knows Steven Tyler and Joe Perry. The other three guys kind of you know they're they're not quite as like at the forefront. They're not quite as the most recognizable names, and it's like. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, no disrespect to Brad Whitford, Tom Hamilton, and Joey Kramer. They're awesome. But it's it, it almost seems like like Steven and Joe were like the more the more famous of uh, of, of the five. But I mean, but everyone has an important role to play in a band. Obviously, the bass is the foundation. And most people don't realize that they, they, they think of I mean, you know, not that not the drums are important, but the bass really sets the tone and really sets the rhythm to it and you know i remember like 10 years ago you know you found bands like the white stripes and you know th th it was almost like it, it was almost a thing for a little bit where it's like they were bands that didn't have bass guitars in them and you notice the difference right away oh yeah i mean if you take that low end out of a sound i mean you can always achieve it with a guitar uh if you want to see a pretty notable example of that you can go back to 88 and look at Injustice for All uh, by Metallica, you know. They really yeah, they really took a lot of the bass out of that album and uh now with, of course with modern technology all these years later, I actually heard Jason Newstead's bass lines turned up a little bit in the mix. Right. And and he was playing some great stuff. Oh, Jason so, Newstead is one of my favorite bass players ever. I mean, and it's that 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 album is notorious for having the bass low in the mix. It's crazy. Yeah, definitely. And so, I mean, to me, um, if you take the bass out of it, it kind of takes the heart out of the entire mix of the song. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up as a hip-hop fan, I certainly always kind of lean toward the low end of hearing stuff. I always like to hear that kick and the low thump of the bass. Exactly. And so maybe uh, growing up as a hip-hop fan could have possibly had a little bit of influence on me moving on to the bass as well. Yeah, you know, that that makes sense when you think about it because you look at other genres like like jazz and R&B or or even like old disco records where it's like the bass is just so upfront and in your face and just just driving everything. You know, sometimes that kind of bleeds over into into the rock stuff. Definitely, man. And you know, uh 
I feel like some there's a time as a bass player to stand out, and there's a time to just stay in the pocket, ride the beat, chug along, and I think that that discretion is really what sets good bass players apart from great bass players. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, going back to what you were saying about uh, about how like being in WMP and playing with Justin and Kyle, that that kind of influenced um, you know your decision to move over to bass. Now, now, did you? I mentioned in the intro that you started the band together. Was that the case, uh, or, or or were they? I mean, I guess were they playing under that name before you were around, or, or what happened there? No, we actually started out. Um, I guess the earliest genesis of the band, uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, would be Justin and Kyle playing with a friend of ours, uh, Mike Hool, on bass, as well as another friend of ours, Jamie, uh, Jamie Stock, on vocals. Okay. And they and they had played like neighborhood house parties and the middle school talent show. This was all before I ever even knew them. Oh, wow. So Justin and Kyle definitely had a history playing together, going back to middle school, and uh, pretty much came up with each other, really developing their chops. And shortly thereafter, uh, in high school, I came along in uh, ninth grade. We all met each other. At that point, Mike was still kind of a bass player, but he kind of took to sports a little bit more, football and wrestling as well as track. And uh, as he transitioned more into wanting to do those things, I transitioned more away from wanting to do those things, high school wrestling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I moved on to playing bass. And, man, I got to tell you, Playing with two guys who had played together already for that many years and were already a couple of years ahead of me talent-wise, that was definitely a challenge in the beginning, man. I I feel like I had to really live up to a lot of expectations and fast-track myself to becoming a good bass player as quick as possible. Definitely. I mean, those those two guys, I, I will always say that about, about Justin and Kyle. When they played together, they, they almost had like this... I mean, you can tell that those guys have been playing together for as long as they had because they just, they almost instinctively knew what the other guy was going to do and were Definitely. able to just play off each other. They just had that chemistry. And, Definitely. Uh, Definitely, man. And uh, I think a lot of that foundation is what led to the formation of WMP being so solid. You know, a lot of people form bands when they're in high school and maybe they'll go cut a couple tracks in the garage or whatever maybe play one show, but even then we were very serious about it, um, about becoming a band who could go out and tour and play live and release records and hopefully gain a following. And, uh, yeah, that was definitely the genesis behind WMP. We wanted to start uh, writing our own original songs and performing them, not just do the whole cover band thing. Yeah, not, not that there's anything wrong with that. No, I love no. I I love playing covers. Me too, man. Um, but yeah, it it, it started out. Um, we played a, a couple of talent shows, Battle of the Bands, in high school, and shortly thereafter, it kind of all morphed into WMP. Um, I think to this day, uh, we still haven't decided exactly what it what it stood for. Uh, <laughs> the band name, as you said in the intro. Uh, however, I do know that the original genesis of the name was between Justin and I. I believe at the time, the actual meaning was weapons of mass production. Yeah, I, I used to drive them nuts when I, whenever I was in the band and I would ask about that. I'm like, guys, that is the first thing people ha ask me. What does WMP stand for? And I've got yes. nothing to tell them. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I, I think at a certain point it almost became like a well, what does WMP mean to you? It could mean numerous right. things. Uh, words, music, percussion, uh, weapons of mass production. There's a million different things you could throw in there. All right, just, just don't call us wimp and I won't punch you in the face. That's right. <laughs> we are not wimp. Yes, no. we, had, we had to make sure that we threw in the, uh, the appropriate periods in there in punctuation right, so that right. we, were, uh, we were much like NWA. We were a, uh, an acronym. Yeah, exactly. It's like CM Punk. You no one really knows what it means, and you know, it's just one of those things. Um, yes. So, I mean, you had played together with them. Uh, now, how long? I mean, because you mentioned middle school was when you kind of met them, or or was it high school when you guys got together? 
Yeah, yeah, it was actually high school uh, freshman year, man. Justin, Justin and I had uh, biology together as well as English, and uh, Kyle and I soon were introduced to each other um, through being friends with Justin and both of us being guitar players, uh, as well as both of us having a connection to the University of Tennessee. Um, Justin grew up a fan of their sports teams, and of course me growing up uh, here in small rural East Tennessee, Oliver Springs, I uh, have always been a diehard Vols fan. And so the, you know, between guitar and uh, sports, Tennessee sports, we kind of connected. Right on, right on, man. Now, uh, you, I, I don't want to get off topic, but you, you were born in Tennessee, and when did when did you live in Florida? I was born uh, here in Tennessee in 1985, and whenever I was 11... I moved to Florida um, to go live with my dad. As many teenagers are or uh, adolescent boys, it kind of gets to a certain point where you need your father's guidance and you need a lot of discipline. And up to about the age of 11, I was a pretty little wild-ass country boy. Uh, <laughs> didn't I mean, my mom definitely tried her best, but at a certain point when you got a, a 12-year-old who's like 5'3 and... 150 pounds. I mean, you can't spank him. You can't tell him to go to his room. I mean, he'll just right. leave. <laughs> so it definitely got to a point there um, around 98 where I really needed my dad's influence in my life. It's like the and Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You're going to meet, live with your dad. Or... Bingo. Yeah, yeah. I, I was. I was sent out to to live with uh, pops. Uh, it wasn't in Bel Air. It was near, uh, however, yeah. was near Bel Air. Well, it's a diff uh, that's a much different kind of Bel Air. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> near Bel Air, Florida. I went to live with my dad down there in Seminole. And uh, yeah, that was uh, 1998. And it would have been 2000 when I met Justin at the beginning of high school. Okay. So, so getting back to what we were saying, you, you met with those guys in freshman year and how long did you end up playing in the band oh well let's see we started uh writing our songs together sophomore year uh, we technically started playing together freshman year in about 2000 and by 2004 by our graduation we had probably between justin and i about 20 original songs written um as well as uh, as well as kyle too um and then high school graduation happened, and of course, as is usually the case, sometimes people move away, things happen. Um, Kyle ended up going to college to play college football as a quarterback. He was a very, very talented quarterback and pitcher in high school. That's awesome. And uh, Justin stayed in the area, and I myself moved back to Tennessee Um in June of 2004, and that kind of put a halt on things as far as our progress actually playing out and really further developing uh, the brand around the Bay Area and beyond that. However, during that time, Justin and I continued to write songs together and send each other riffs. Uh, of course, you know, 2004, 2005, the Internet's in full swing at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, we definitely use technology to our our advantage, just like yeah. we do today. I mean, uh, even to this day, Justin and I live in two completely different places, uh, separated by nearly a thousand miles, and we continue to work together seamlessly uh, on music and all of our other creative ventures. Definitely, and I'm going to get into Chronicord a little bit later on, but um, but yeah, so you played with them all throughout high school, and then. Because I remember I came into the picture around like 07. Were you still playing with them up to that point? Or, I mean, just kind of coming back and forth from Tennessee to Florida? Or well, what the, was happening? Between the years uh, 2004, 2005, I was here in Tennessee. Um, in December of 2005, I moved back to Florida on my own. Um, you know, kind of first real move out into the world on my own. And uh, at that point, I resumed being the bass player of WMP. We had a, uh, we finally got a vocalist, Justin Hall, mm -hmm. uh, who was our first singer for the band. And we played 
a ton of shows around the Bay Area. Um, a lot of those were Battle of the Bands, stuff like that, but we also had uh, a few gigs of our own. And that was where we really first got to showcase some of those songs that uh, that you mentioned, even playing later into the Impatient Nation years of the band. So that was your first time, like actually, like playing gigs. I mean, all throughout high school, you guys were playing together. But did you guys play out even back then? Or no? Uh, well, kinda. Uh, we, as I had mentioned, we played like battle of the bands type stuff at school at our high school. Right. Like maybe like and... any backyard parties or anything like that, or. I don't think we ever had a chance to play a backyard party in high school. That uh, the, I think we probably would have been a little bit too busy enjoying the party than we would have been playing. <laughs> However, um, shortly thereafter, shortly after high school, whenever we all kind of resumed, uh, resumed together at the beginning of 2006, uh, we played a ton of shows. Um, our first show, however, it, it was pretty cool, a place that I know you played many times, and I believe you and I may have shared the stage there at one point. Uh, boomers in Seminole. That was uh, the site of our first first official gig, paid gig, and man, what a rush it was to get on stage for the first time and have all your buddies and your friends and your family come. Man, the, what that, a rush! That was awesome. Now, now for those of you listening who don't know, Boomers was a club in uh, in Seminole, Florida. And it was a really, really a cool club, like a big high stage, lots of room to run around. It's a shame that it closed years ago, but uh, but yeah, I, I remember playing a bunch of uh, a bunch of WMP gigs there. I don't think we ever played like on the same night or, or like at the same time at Boomers. I you know I think you know I think you and I played together just like maybe like a handful of stuff, and that was later on like the Impatient Nation stuff where you would sub in, but um. But yeah, I mean, I, I I do I do remember seeing pictures of you guys playing at Boomers. But um... you know what? Actually, I want to say now that I think about it, and I've had a moment to sit here and reflect, I think actually we, if you want to get technical about it, we shared the stage at Boomers because I think I came down on vacation, or at some point I was there, and I think I sat in for a song while you were playing bass and you, you took a break and then, yeah. So I guess if you want to get technical about it for all of those that are keeping score, all, I, 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 all, all none of you out there. I don't, um, I don't remember that, but I do remember, I think, cause I think you and I actually met face to face, like at like a show at boomers. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Cause I remember hearing let me in for the first time and I yeah. was like, Man, all right, this guy can write riffs. I like this. <laughs> Thank you, brother. That was uh, I'm I'm real proud of that song and how that turned out. But Definitely. um, but yeah. So so was it moving back and forth? Now, why did I, I mean, what would what actually happened there with? Because eventually, I mean, eventually they needed a bass player. That's how I got into the picture. Was it you moving back and forth to Tennessee or were there other circumstances involved with you kind of officially leaving the band or, I mean, I, it you, was, you don't have to get into too many details if you don't want. I, I was just curious about what happened there. To make a long story short, I would say the biggest, the biggest factors into you coming into the band as my replacement, as the next bass player for WMP. Um, a lot of that was, yeah, like you said, me, moving back and forth from here to Florida. Um, at that point, there were, yeah, as there are in any band, it's like a family. You guys have fights. You have squabbling. It happens. You mm -hmm. make up. Everything's cool. Um, but no, mostly it was just a, a series of circumstances that kind of were dealt to me in life, uh, kind of getting kicked out on your ass mm -hmm. and getting into the real world for the first time that uh, kind of surprised me, caught me off guard and uh, put me in a position to where um, I wasn't able to devote enough energy and time and attention to the band to really be a member. And so um, they started the search for a bass player and they found one hell of a bass player in you, my friend. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And it's, for, for one thing, like how how often do you find like two guys who like were in the same band and the same instrument end up end up talking to each other like this? It's kind of crazy. You don't really hear about that sort of thing too much. And and I mean to make it even more crazy, 
two guys who are complete pro wrestling nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and just to stack up the, the the odds against us being friends again, as of course we refer to each other as the Mason Dixon connection. Um, <laughs> it, the, it, it's true. You and I really are the northern and southern versions of each other. Me being yes. from Pennsylvania, you being from deep in the heart of Dixie. Oh and, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's 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 really pretty funny how many similarities there are, and really how improbable it is. Because uh, I mean, I'm sure as you having been in more bands than I have over the years, uh, there's always a bit of a divide there. Either whenever you're the guy who's coming in, or if the guy who you're replacing is still kind of there. Or whatever the circumstances are, usually it doesn't work out to where you guys are friends. Right. It, it, it's usually kind of awkward, and it, it and it always, but it always blows my mind when you have like guys who like replace other guys or talk bad about their replacements. Where it's like, wait a minute, why would you have a problem with this guy? He's just taking a gig. Exactly. The, the only reason it didn't work out is it, that's like between you and the other guys in the band. Like, you know, don't don't bash this dude. He's just trying to do his thing. Like, you know. But I think that probably happens more with, like, singers replacing each other. Yeah, likely so. But, man, I, I always thought it was a pretty seamless transition, and I uh, I thought you did a great job of coming in there, um, filling in for somebody like myself who was uh, kind of, not to butter myself up, but I was kind of an established entity at that point. I mean, we had been playing together as a trio for... Go like five, six years at that point, roughly. So oh, yeah, man. Well, I mean, you were you helped lay the groundwork for that band. So it was, I mean, your your influence was still there. Just, I mean, even even after the fact, definitely. So I mean, so you ended up um, was it around oh six oh seven when you moved back to Tennessee for good. That was August of two thousand seven. I moved back up here to Tennessee for good. Uh, a couple of different choices and circumstances kind of influenced me moving back here. Um, number one was my mom uh, got clean for the first time pretty much since I was a kid. Uh, my mom was an uh, IV as well as other drug user for many years. And finally in 2007, she got her act together. And uh, after many years of having a strained relationship at best, um, I thought it was time to mend fences and, and make things right or close the book on it. So I moved back up here in search of, uh, either new beginnings or closure and, uh, happy to report that right now it's, uh, Far into the new beginnings uh, side of things, it's not closure. Uh, my mom is clean. Uh, of course, as anybody listening who is addicted to anything or had, knows someone, you know, whether it's their friend or family member who is an addict, it's not something that stops. Um, but I feel like she does a pretty good job of, of uh, fighting it and... Uh, haven't really had anything bad happen. My mom and I have a pretty good relationship these days. So all in all, looking back on it, here, geez, what are we at? Seven years now yeah. since then. Uh, I feel like I made the right decision. Well, I absolutely you did. And, uh, you know, there's something to be said for that as far as, you know, overcoming something like that and coming out on the other side. I mean, I think you really have to look at um, look at those sort of situations with compassion and forgiveness and be able to move forward and not to let that define what is otherwise a good relationship. And I'm, and I'm so happy for you that you have, you know, your mom in, in your life and you have that relationship. I know she had had a few health issues over the years, but as far as I know, she's, she's doing fine now. Is she? Yeah. Yeah. She's doing good. She, uh, she had to have a tumor removed last, uh, or oh, not last year, earlier this year. That's right. Um, that's right. Thankfully, it uh, was not cancerous or not uh, malignant, rather. So that was taken out with no problem, and uh, things seem to be going pretty good health-wise for my dear old mommy. That's right. And uh, uh, you know, the second part of that, uh, those choices of coming up here, was uh, also my grandmother, my mom's mom. Um, she's getting a little bit older, and back whenever I was. Just before, I would say about 11, right before I moved to Florida, uh, 
Uh, as I mentioned, I was a little wild ass country boy, uh, not a lot of discipline. And at the time, before I went to my, live with my dad, I went to live with my grandmother. And she did a pretty good job of keeping me disciplined, but even then, um, it wasn't enough. So being in, so being an adult now, um, you know, coming back and all this, uh, it, it kind of happened all together at a time when, as I mentioned, my mom was an IV drug user and pretty heavy and she did a you know, I don't hold it against her, but there was a lot of damage and fallout that came from that um, here at my grandma's house, and things were pretty chaotic for her for quite a few years. So a big part of me coming up here as well was not only to either close the book on the relationship with my mom or make a fresh start, it was also to make sure that n no more of this bullshit went down with my grandma having to deal with the fallout of her children's choices. And that's where I am today. Um, my, my grandma's good to go. She's, uh, she'll be turning 83 in October. Um, she's as sharp as ever and ornery as a wet hen. <laughs> um, uh, man, you know, it's kind of crazy being recorded here and you, I feel like you're kind of capturing a, a real moment here of me thinking back because, wow, it's been all these years ago and uh, looking back on it, man, it's it's all kind of crazy to see the circumstances that lead you to where you are today. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, God bless you for going up there and taking care of, you know, your grandma and your mom. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, you're definitely a good son and a good grandson. It's funny how the roles kind of reverse sometimes as we get older and, and as we take care of them, you know, as, as we both, as we get older and as they get older, and it's funny how life works in that, in that way. But I mean, you know, it's like I said, you, you can't, you know, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. That's and, right. Um, and it sounds like, it sounds like you got a good thing going up there. Yeah, man. I mean, you, you only get one family, uh, whether you like them or not, you got to make the best of it. And, uh, at the end of the day, I hate to tell any of you young folks out there, but my dad told me growing up many, many times, son, if you end up with five or six good friends that you can count on outside of your family, consider yourself a lucky man. And uh, at the end of the day, the only people that are going to be there for you is your family. Thankfully, I haven't exactly experienced that to be true just yet. However, uh, I gotta definitely stress to anybody out there who doesn't really grasp the thought, cherish your family, make sure to, uh, always have good relationships with them. Absolutely. Be because that's, you know, at the end of the day, there's only so many people on this planet that, uh, that you can call family. And, uh, once they're gone, they're gone. Absolutely. And, uh, just cherish the time that, that you have. Um, now with all that, all that being said, do you ever see yourself moving back, back to Florida? You know, at this point, I, I gotta be realistic. I, I just left Florida last week. Uh, I got a, got a chance to catch up with you. That's right. Um, as well as a lot of my other friends and, uh, celebrate my dad's 60th birthday. And after coming home, you know, I had this little moment on the plane where, as we're making our descent into McGee Tyson here in Knoxville, I'm looking over at the mountains and I'm, it's just about sunset and right around sunset. I, I can see it right now as we're recording. I look out my window here in Tennessee, the rolling Hills and the mountains of the Appalachians, they kind of take on like a bluish purple hue at, at sunset, something, you know, light reflecting off of them or whatever. But something about me, man, whenever I saw those trees and those mountains coming back in from this last vacation, something said inside of me, you're home. Yeah. So I've, I've always tried to, tried to be a guy who really operates on instinct and gut feeling and, you know, it's never steered me wrong. And it's one of those moments I kind of always check myself whenever I come home. Do I want to move back to Florida? And uh, I definitely asked myself that question the last time I came home, and the answer is no, I, I really don't. I love Florida. 
love the beach, some of the most beautiful women in the Ooh, world. Yeah. So many different cultures, so many different foods, languages. There's just so much stuff. Um, but to me, man, Tennessee, uh, it's just a slower pace of life. There's a lot more room and time to to really be an introvert. Yeah. And uh, and to really work on yourself, you know, um, to improve your, your skill sets in life and uh, achieve your goals without so much of the hustle and bustle and social life aspect being such a focus, really. Um, just speaking for my own personal sake, it seems like whenever I'm in a place where there's always something to do, I'm going to go do it. Right. But if I'm in a place where there's not really a lot to do after dark, I'm probably going to be sitting at the house reading a book or working on music or learning something, whatever it may be. So... Something about Tennessee life, man, it just works for me. Again, not a knock on all of my buddies down south. I, obviously, as I <laughs> I spend a lot of money every year coming down to visit um, just because I love it so much. But, I mean, whenever you can get a round-trip flight for under 200 bucks to go see your buds, why bother moving back? Yeah, no, well... First of all, that's a hell of a deal as far as uh, as far as airfare, but uh, but yeah, no, I, I I can definitely I can definitely relate to what you feel like because anytime anytime I go up north, anytime I go to Philly and, and all the suburbs, the areas I grew up, I mean there there are some parts that I don't quite miss as much, but there are other parts that I do I you know I have that feeling of feeling at home and now granted I'm probably uh, I'm probably down here in Florida to stay. I mean, uh, my wife is from Florida and I don't think she has any interest in moving up to the cold, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, and I do like it here in Orlando, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I know what you mean, you know, about, you know, about relating, about feeling comfortable in a certain place and Tennessee and Oliver Springs specifically, it sounds like a really, really beautiful place. I hopefully I'll get the chance to visit one of these days. Yeah, I hope so, man. Uh, it's definitely, an, uh, as many people describe it, a trip back like 15 years into the past. Um, it's just, it's one of those places you have to experience for yourself. It's just different here. Everything about it here is different. And uh, it, like I said, it works for me. Absolutely, man. Well, my wife has been to Gatlinburg a lot, which is, from what I understand, is relatively close to you, maybe like a couple hours away. But she yeah. has it up there, and uh, so who knows? Maybe one of these days we'll uh, we'll have to swing on by. Definitely, but, um, man. Yeah, next time you guys come up to Gatlinburg, uh, that's about an hour away from me. So uh, hit me up on the old bat phone, and I'll be coming right on up. We'll have to get some grub. And, absolutely. Um, maybe have to give you guys a little tour through the – Great Smoky Mountains National Park there. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome, man. Well, hey, um, let's talk about Chronicord for a little bit. All right. If someone asks you, you know, what is Chronicord, um, just, you know, kind of explain uh, to our listeners what exactly you guys are doing. Chronocord is, it's the culmination of all these years of Justin and I working together in music and being friends and exchanging ideas um, we, of course, we have our original music, which we compose, um, primarily just because we like it and it's the kind of music that we like to make. Um, but we also, we try to tackle different genres. Um, and w one of the main things in this, one of the main influences and I guess rules you would say of Chrono Chord is that there are no rules. We have no limits. We're not going to be limited by genre. Um, as you said, we do everything from hip hop to uh, electronic dance style stuff, 8 bit chip tunes, um, all the way down to some really pretty classical style, acoustic, very natural sounding um, instruments. And um, yeah, I mean, it's really all that wrapped into one. Uh, we primarily create. We create our music for license throughout entertainment um, for use in commercials. Uh, we just recently licensed some of our music for use in a video game, um, which has been really, really exciting. It's been one of those 
um, personal bucket list kind of things I've always wanted to do. Wow, I mean, can can you say what the video game is yet, or uh, I mean, I actually can't really divulge any details just yet. Okay, uh, okay, I, I, just I, because of the fact that it's not uh, it's not complete, but just contracts what, and all that. I, I understand. Right on, yeah, but um, that, that it, is huge news, though. That that is awesome. Yeah, definitely. It's been a very personally satisfying thing, and uh, hopefully we're going to continue to see our music licensed for use in TV, radio, movies, uh, on the internet, whatever it may be. Um, we're wanting to be the, the number one spot to go to for if you need music for your creation or if you want to bring your own creations musically to life. Um, we also have the skills and the expertise necessary to fully produce music. Um, we don't yet have a studio that we'd like to have, as those get pretty pricey. However, uh, we definitely utilize technology to our advantage in everything. We try to make up for our lack of high t- uh, high price tag gear. We try to make up for that with our level of expertise and a tish- and we try to make up for that with our level of expertise and attention to detail. Um, a lot of professional mixers or producers or mastering guys, they're going to give your song one pass and they're going to charge you out the butt for it. In our case, we're going to give your songs as many passes as it takes because everything that we put out we want it to be just as good as if it was a chronochord song or whatever it may be, even if it was a video that we produce, uh, which is an, uh, another thing that we do. We produce videos on YouTube covering gaming, pro wrestling, um, music, movies, sports, the whole, pretty much everything, pop culture. Um, so really all that kind of comes together. Um, it's just... Chronochord is the the essence of our, all of our creative outlets rolled into one, and uh, I hope that throughout the future it's going to continue to be a very uh, fulfilling and rewarding outlet uh, in many ways. You know, I, I I think it will be honestly, and uh, this is one of those things where it's like even years ago I was thinking I'm like, you know. The guys write all this music, and and even from from day one when I walked into the original band WMP, I noticed just how just how much music that Justin and Kyle and Matt and all those guys were able to write, and yourself, and you know the, there was so much diversity in that band, and that it came out. I mean, yeah, we were a rock band, but we we incorporated a lot of different sounds into our sound, and there were a lot of just demos. And just all kinds of instrumental demos that they were, would record that weren't necessarily a right fit for the band, but I would always think, like, man, I really hope they do something with this. And I would look at Justin, who is, I mean, Justin is a genius behind the board. And just, a, I mean, in terms of composing and engineering and producing and all that stuff. And so you guys, you guys are doing exactly what you should have always been doing. And finding a vehicle for this music that may not necessarily fit into the confines of a rock band, even though you know rock and roll certainly incorporates a lot of different sounds in there. But yeah, but even even beyond just like writing, you know, writing popular songs. I mean, you have you know vehicles for all those different sounds to get out. Whether it's like scoring movies or you know, I always thought like. Justin should be like the next Danny Elfman. You know, he should be like scoring movies or something like that. Oh, and, man. Justin is definitely going to pop for that if he hears this. He is a, a big Danny Elfman fan, as am I. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he and I would like, we would exchange like Danny Elfman stuff and like Brad Arnold and like he would send me a Neo Morricone and, and like all these different like film composers. And I was thinking like, man, that's what you should do, man. And, and it sounds like. You guys, you guys are really like cracking the code when it comes to this thing because it's not just, you know, it's not just random YouTube clips. It's you know, you have a specific purpose behind it. Whether it's using it, developing other artists, and having all these different outlets for it, such as video games. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's really 
a lot of really rewarding stuff that comes with this. I mean, he and I, uh, Justin and I, have always been big video game fans, big sports fans. As I mentioned previously, you know me, I'm a uh, a pro wrestling junkie. I mean, pretty much um, a historian. Um, it's kind of been my favorite sport growing up. Um, absolutely, absolutely, and we and we are going to get to that in a little bit. Yeah. But, but be, before we go down that road, I just, um, you know, I, I I'm always curious because um, I, I know I personally I I look at you know studio equipment and mixing and all that sort of thing is almost like another instrument. Like I'm I'm pretty illiterate when it comes to that sort of thing. I've tried to be a little bit better, just picking stuff up here and there. But as far as recording. It's definitely like almost another world to me, and uh, so I, I, I'm always curious. Like, how does being in the studio and taking on more of like a producer or session musician role, how does that for you? How does that compare to say being in a band and being a live performer? Do, it, do, is it something you prefer as opposed to like being in the band dynamic, or um, it just you know? Obviously, I know you love what you're doing now, but how does that? How would you compare that to as being a guy who's played in bands over the years? Um, I would compare the two being just directly as as best as I could as far as how rewarding they are to me or how much fun I have. Uh, I would say I have an equal amount of fun uh, being on stage as I do, uh, whether it's me composing something or sequencing something. Um there's always that moment where you just get that really, really good feeling and you kind of get those those goosebumps down your back and you're like, yeah, this is going to be good. Um, really, the biggest difference I can find between the two is whenever you're in a band, there's a major focus on your stage show and your live uh, your live show and how tight you are together and how good you sound. And whenever you go into the studio, there's a little bit, more emphasis on the technical side of things on how to get the best sound out of your songs. And I think it, it, I think it's definitely challenging as a musician to transition from being a live touring musician to being almost exclusively a studio musician. It's been very enlightening and uh, educating to me to be able to kind of, to kind of, fall into this role. Um, Justin is a little bit further ahead of the curve than I am as far as producing, um, having all of the talents and uh, credentials necessary to to hang in there with the biggest names in production and music. Um, however, you know, I feel like I've started to develop my skill set quite a bit under... Uh, under his tutelage, if you will, I'm not really under his tutelage because uh, you know he. Well, and I mean, I are both... he he has that experience. You mean I mean, exactly as far as, like drawing from his experience and working together, not necessarily like a teacher student thing, but just exactly more guys learning from each other and that and that sort of thing. Definitely, but I see man. what you're saying. Yeah, and and more than anything, it's it's almost like a motivation because if I see. Um, you know, success for somebody else like Justin, you know, he's, he's done well. Um, even going back to being a guitar player, uh, he started before I did. And so he was always kind of the guy that I looked up to as like, I need to be as good as this guy. Oh yeah. He is a phenomenal guitar player, by the way. Absolutely. And there's, to me, there's nothing more healthy in any kind of dynamic, whether it's a band or a friendship or, family or whatever it is there's no better dynamic than whenever you can provide that inspiring type of challenge to each other to keep upping your game and to keep becoming better and keep becoming smarter and to keep adding little tricks to your to your toolkit um that's pretty much where we're at now um you know the the two of us we we balance each other out pretty well um, I'm starting to get a little bit more into the video production and graphic design side of things. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I've been able to have the chance to kind of teach Justin a little bit on that. And more on the visual end. A- absolutely. And, and of course, you know, his strong suit is the audio. Um, he, You know, sometimes he hears stuff that just blows me away that I would not hear unless he pointed it out. 
So, uh, you know, it, it works out great, man. The two of us uh, make a pretty damn good team, I got to say. Um, Absolutely. And the, and the fact that you guys remain committed to the to this project, despite him being in Florida, you being in Tennessee, it is astounding. I mean, I mean that's, you got to love this technology, right? The, the, the world that we're in, we're, the world is a much smaller place. And the fact that you guys are able to do everything remotely and still remain committed to it and still generate good content is... Uh, it's you know it, it's pretty amazing definitely man technology is a beautiful thing uh he and i can sit and have a conversation must much like you and i are having right now oh yeah uh over skype and it sounds pretty good uh you know with a little bit of audio editing and everything it almost sounds like you're in the same room together exactly so uh you know technology has always been something we've tried to stay ahead of the curve on and always used to our advantage. And uh, I think we're doing that now here today. Exactly. And not, and not just in the, the music production. Uh, you know, Chronicord has been getting into podcasting a lot. I've been on your podcast quite a bit. And, um, you know, are, are you thinking about developing sort of like a podcast network? Like maybe get a couple different different shows on there? or You know, um, I know that there's definitely um, a podcasting element. But I wouldn't quite call us a podcast because... I mean, we kind of encompass, uh, encompass music and video, like vlogging mm-hmm. style podcast uh, discussions. It's kind of all in one. Um, so, as far as the actual podcasting medium itself, uh, much like this, it's something that I'm definitely leaning toward uh, a little bit more on a regular basis, perhaps uh, having a Chronocord podcast get together once a week, once every two weeks, whatever it is, with a guest, and uh, just talk shop about what we enjoy. Um, that's definitely something that we're we're looking to expand more on in the future. But uh, for right now, we're really just trying to develop our content and make it the best that we can make it. Absolutely. And speaking of some of the content that I've had the pleasure of joining you on, on some of your Chronocord vlogs slash podcast slash whatever you want to call them, and we've hinted at this throughout the episode, so finally, let, let's get to it. Pro wrestling. It's something that you and I both enjoy besides music, and I think one of the things you and I connected on as friends, uh, I remember that light bulb going off, and it's kind of like that moment in Step Brothers. I'm like, did we just become best friends? <laughs> that is too funny, man, because I, I definitely had the same thing. I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This guy likes wrestling, and he's playing... Wait, he he's not playing bass. He's playing bass in my band. Hey. This guy this guy took my spot and he's just like me. I think we're going to have to be friends. You know, I like the cut of his jib. Yeah, I like this guy. <laughs> I mean, who am I to argue with someone who uh, comes in playing bass and loving pro wrestling? I mean, how could I? Well, we're very much cut from the same cloth as that way, and uh, I think we're going to have to go do karate in the garage for a little bit. I think so, man. Hopefully we can uh, get this bunk bed arrangement worked out, though. You know, I don't all, know. all kinds of room for activities. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about wrestling for a little bit. You are one of the most knowledgeable guys I know about wrestling. I thought I was a pretty diehard fan. You you blow me away with some of the stuff that you know about, some of the history of the business. Have you always been a fan of it? Or was it yeah. just something that was always around as you were growing up? Yeah, definitely. I've I've been a fan of it. Uh, I can actually remember the most of the genesis of me becoming a fan, I think, was the toys that came out at the time. Um, I turned, let's see... About 1990-ish was when uh, Hulkamania was in full swing. The Ultimate Warrior was pretty popular. And I can remember being about four or five, six years old, somewhere in there, and uh, going and seeing the WWF toys that were on shelves at the time and just thinking, man, these guys are pretty cool looking. It's like superheroes, but what the heck is wrestling they really were they really were like real life superheroes it was it was crazy and and you still are to this day and, and i think that's i think that's part of the appeal of it you definitely know, a lot of people will ask me like jack why why are you you know why are you watching that stuff and i i will admit sometimes i'll see you know when it's bad it can be horrible <laughs> let's be honest yeah. And, oh, yeah. and you know but you know when it's good it can be i, I think like the the perfect blend of drama and athletics. And, Definitely. 
And I think that that's that's really what the appeal is. Yes, uh, obviously we know that it's pre- that it's scripted, that it's predetermined. Yes. I, I'll still have people coming up to me. He's like, you know, that's fake, right? I'm like, no, I thought the Undertaker was really a zombie. Like, come on, dude. Yeah, I mean, geez, come on. Uh, hey, you, you know, know, guess guess what? Robert Downey Jr. doesn't act doesn't actually own a flying armored suit that he goes mm-hmm. around in. But I'll we be still, it, damned. I know. I know it's a shock, but we still enjoy that anyway. It's entertainment, folks. That's right. That's right. It all comes down to entertainment. Um, I mean, I can remember from the very first time I saw pro wrestling, uh, right after, like I mentioned, I saw the the toys for the first time as a little kid and just thought they were cool. I didn't even know what the heck wrestling was. And I turned it on one morning uh, right before or right after Ninja Turtles was on on the old Saturday morning routine there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I tuned in and watched WWF superstars and I've been hooked ever since I spent the majority of my childhood going back and renting all the old VHS tapes that I could and just watching as much pro wrestling as I could. And here I am pushing 30 years old. Um, I would like to consider myself to be a historian of pro wrestling at this point. And like you said, um, you know, I think pro wrestling is an art form. It, it, it very, very much so combines the, the world of athletics and athletic feats, um, with, with drama and stage shows and classic acting going all the way back to Shakespeare. Um, to me, it's almost like one of the most perfect performance arts that there is. It's all about um, storytelling. Absolutely. And, you know, whenever you throw in the fact that, at least in WWE's case, they go live for three hours every week. Aside from Saturday Night Live and maybe your evening news, I don't know of any other telecasts that are going to be live like that, where if the performer screws up, guess what? Everybody is going to see it. It's pretty remarkable. I mean, they you know do like three uh, you know three hundred shows a year. There's no off season. Nope. S- sometimes I wish there was, but you know, it, but it is what it is, and it's just you know I have so much respect for everyone who's involved in that. And obviously, like you said, you're a historian. You have you have like old VHS tapes dating to like the early eight. Well, not the early eighties, like like late eighties, like like old like. Um, the the WWF superstar show that would be on Saturday morning back in the day or primetime yeah. wrestling and, and it just you have a collection that probably rivals the WWE network at this point it's it's definitely taken me many years to build it up but uh yeah that's that's kind of one of my <clears throat> that's kind of one of my uh one of my favorite things is going back and watching old pro wrestling um it seems to be a little bit better back then a little bit more focus on the in-ring aspect rather than the the storylines and sometimes cheesy reality era kind of stuff we get today. Yeah. But, um, yeah, man, I mean, pro wrestling is just, I don't know how to say it. I love it. I love pro wrestling. Um, you know, anybody out there who wants to say it's fake, that's fine. It is fake, but... Well, it's more I mean, staged, I think, is, is Yeah, I mean... If pro wrestling is fake, then Seinfeld is fake, and yeah. well, what, Friends is you, fake. Why don't you talk to Mick Foley, who fell off a 15-foot steel cage back in 98, and ask him how fake it feels. I mean, I don't know of anybody who goes and finds Steve Buscemi and is like, Hey, The Sopranos was, wasn't was real, you know that, right? You're like, yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Tell me something I, I don't know. Yeah. Jeez, but those guys on. also really get hurt. And really take some physical abuse too. So it's physically, it can be very real at times. I mean, not not. It's not like it's not like MMA fighting. They're not like really trying to knock each other out. But I mean, they those guys take some punishment. You, know, you take chair shots to the back and the head, and take falls, what they call bumps in the business. You know, you take those quite a bit. You know, you'll feel it. Oh yeah, and uh, you know, whenever it's done right, uh, hopefully the guys don't feel it. Uh, that's kind Hopefully. of part of the whole art of it is the creating the suspension of disbelief and Absolutely. making somebody believe that you're getting your butt kicked in there without actually getting your butt kicked. Uh, it definitely takes a lot of art to that. Um, anybody who's ever done the joke where they swing a punch at their buddy's face and stop it 
just messing with them and then accidentally punch their buddy in the nose. Yeah. Uh, definitely knows it's not easy to pull a punch and it's not easy to, to make it look good. Mm-hmm. So uh, most of my appreciation really comes from the storytelling, the the live theater aspect of it, the live improv, and uh, the fact that you have to, like I said, you have to make it look devastating without it actually hurting a bit. Absolutely. Now, when, when, when you were first watching it as a kid, who was uh, who was your favorite guy? Oh, man. If you had to I, pick one. I would have to say my favorite was probably Sting. Going back to uh, to my early years, I can remember taking my Sting action figure into the barber shop at like six years old and being like, "I want this haircut." Of course, the old uh, the the flat old top, flat top, yeah, With the rat tail he had back then for a little bit. <laughs> and hey, I had it too, man. Nice. There's uh, there's definitely pictures out there of me looking like a little stinger. Uh, I believe I was a mashup of Sting and the Ultimate Warrior one year for Halloween um, at that age, which I can't even remember what the costume was. I think it was an Ultimate Warrior actual costume bodysuit. Just had both the Blade Runners right there. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it was just well, that. I mean, was also grown up. Yeah, also grown up in Tennessee. I mean that that was the territory right there. That's sort of the mid south, mid Atlantic you know, kind of area where, where Sting kind of came up and then obviously with WCW and everything. And I, I, I was aware of Sting a little bit when, when I was younger. I, I always thought he was cool. I definitely appreciated him even more later on in my life, even to this day. Obviously he's part of, he's a partial inspiration for some of my on stage personas, but um, yeah, Sting was, Sting was the man. I mean, he was a total rock star even back then. And uh, oh, yeah. for, Hey, for, I mean, speaking of Sting, the rock star, how well, funny not, is it? I'm not talking about the bass player from the police. We're talking about the wrestler. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but how funny is it that one of my favorite bass players and one of my favorite wrestlers are both known as Sting? Yeah. That's Pretty crazy. Too funny. Pretty crazy. That's too funny, man. Well, I mean, I was, I was going to wrap up asking you who your favorite bass player is. Would you say that Sting, Gordon Sumner, is your favorite bass player if you had to pick one? Gun oh, oh, man. You just put me right on the hot seat right here. I'm going. Um, I'm... <laughs> it's so hard for me to pick one favorite bass player. Um, I'm going to say just based upon composition of bass lines. Um, sometimes I would say that Sting would be my favorite because of the simplistic uh, but so memorable bass lines that he always created with the police. Uh, other days I would say it's probably somebody like a Lenny or a Cliff Burton who is more spitting out a ton of notes and these crazy thrashy picking patterns and, uh, you know, a real speed demon. And other days I would tell you that it's a guy like a duck Dunn or, yeah. uh, you know, someone like that who, uh, who really stayed in the pocket and just funked out. Um, but all those names, I mean, sting, um, has got to be one of the biggest influences. Uh, the police are certainly one of my favorite bands of all time. Absolutely. Do you have a, do you have a favorite producer? Ooh, Ooh, good question. Seeing as how Uh, you're getting into that line of work, I didn't know if there was any, any one particular producer or production group that, that you were, that was a particular huge influence for you. I would say one major influence on me would be Dr. Dre. Um, really? Yeah, absolutely. I always grew up, uh, <laughs> just kind of funny for a little fat white kid from Tennessee to be growing up in 92, 93, bumping doggy style and the chronic and hey man, all those the, rec- oh, those records were everywhere. <laughs> absolutely, man. I mean, it's kind of funny to think back on, but Dr. Dre was always an influence on me musically, not only because I enjoyed his music, but he also kind of went outside of the box. I mean, he he's produced for Gwen Stefani, um, for uh, all kinds of different people, man, and had a lot of success doing it. Um, Dr. Dre is also another guy who takes his time. Uh, the world right now is waiting for him to drop his next album and has been since 2001. Um, that's right, yeah. I mean... And, you know, I feel like that's something that's – it could be viewed as a little bit over overindulgent, to take your time and make sure that your creations are the absolute best they could be. But 
if you're going to create something that which everything that we create, you know, as musicians is very personal. Oh yeah. Um, it almost takes on a life of its own. It's kind of like raising a child. Why would you raise a child if you weren't going to raise the best child that you could? Uh, why, absolutely. Why would you write and develop a song unless it was the best song that you could put out? Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I know when it comes to being in the studio, like I'm more comfortable getting up, in, in, you know, on stage in front of a bunch of people than singing in the studio. Singing that, like that, that kind of gets me nervous a little bit getting in there because once it's once it's on tape, man, it's it's there forever. Oh yeah, yeah. that's and that's so, for sure, man. You know, that's I mean, that's why I, I mean, especially especially with my voice, I try to make sure that it that it sounds good, that I, I'm not hitting any flat or sharp notes, that I'm, you know, that, that that my breath is good, that you know, just everything, you know, enunciation is good, and because yes. and it's like you know, because once it's out there, that's the version of the, of your song that most people are going to listen to. So Absolutely. You want to make sure you know. Say what you will about things being overproduced, but you know that is your product. That is that is your piece of work that you're you know handing out to everybody. So you want to make sure it sounds the very best it can possibly be. Definitely, man. Uh, anything on record, you know, there's a certain sense of uh, finality to it and definiteness. That okay, I mean, once it's on, it's on. Like you said, the whole world can hear it. Yeah. And uh, I think that definitely puts you on your A game. Yeah, um, and, and you know, and even on the other hand, sometimes there are little mistakes that happen in the studio that turn to gold. And especially, absolutely. Especially in the old days where everything was analog, you'd have like little mistakes creep in here, here and there, or, or little things, but they ended up sounding great. So yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's definitely a tough line to walk. Definitely. F- final question: um, All right. Do you have a favorite songwriter or a songwriting duo? Oh, man, here we go. This is another great question. I like this. My usual stock answer for this, and I guess I'll give a two-part answer here. Uh, A, my usual stock answer for this is John Fogarty. John Fogarty is that one guy, uh, of course, the lead singer and guitarist uh, with Credence Clearwater Revival. Um, I have seen eight-month-old children dancing along happy to CCR songs. And I have seen 88 year old people dancing along happy to CCR songs. So to me, songwriting, it's always about expressing a thought, but really at the end of the day, songwriting comes down to how many people hear your song and how many people are impacted by your song. So if we're going off that criteria alone, John Fogarty has got to be number one on just about anybody's list. I mean, look at all those hits. And uh, kind of along that same token, man, Hall of Notes. Uh, yeah. You know, whatever you want to call them, 80s throwbacks, uh, you know. Those guys are great songwriters, great performers uh, between the three of them. And um, also great live, even to this day, as they get a little bit further up in their years. So, Absolutely, I'm, man. So, I, I mean, I, those, those are good choices. Like you said, they, they just transcend age and generation and you know location and, and, and all, all those things. That's yeah. really the mark of a great songwriter when you're connecting with people on a personal level like that. I think so, definitely. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to expressing a thought and – uh, even in a feeling or a memory or whatever it may be that you put into a song, um, anytime you can create something and other people can harness that same feeling, uh, there's got to be a certain sense of accomplishment to that for a guy like John Fogarty or uh, Daryl Hall and John Oates. So um, I, I would say those guys would be just off the top of my head. I mean, I could sit here all day and name off great musicians, great producers, great songwriters and why I like them um, as, as I'm sure you could too. Absolutely. And I guess, I mean, you know, it's funny. I thought of another question. I mean, I was almost going to ask you what your favorite band or or a favorite artist might be, but I think that kind of goes hand in hand with songwriter as well. I guess you you could say. So that works out great, man. Um, You know, before we wrap it up here, is there anything else you'd like to plug? I mean, obviously, Chronicord is is your main gig right now, but uh, anything else you'd like to plug before we uh, sign off? No, you guys can find me at chronocord.com alongside Justin, JC, 
my tag team partner, my partner in crime. Um, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, just search Chrono Cord. You find us there. Definitely like and subscribe if you don't mind. It helps us out to bring you guys more content and better content. You can find us on SoundCloud as well at Chrono Cord. We're at Twitter um, at Chrono Cord. Pretty much Chrono Cord on uh, anything you can think of. Uh, including Instagram. Um, I just today recently created a Periscope account. Have you heard of this Periscope thing, Jack? I, I, I've I've heard of it. Like I've heard people mention it. I don't really know a lot about it yet. Um, from from what I gather, you can essentially live broadcast at any point, and people can pick up on it. So it's kind of like a long form Snapchat or. Instagram seems pretty cool. So maybe uh, if any of you guys out there on Periscope find us Chrono Cord, uh, you can add us there, and uh, maybe we'll have some super secret, exclusive content coming to Periscope sometime in the near future. Very cool. Just like an instant like streaming thing, you can just you know stream whatever you need to just right there at the moment. Most definitely, man. We may end up uh, bringing our fans and followers right into the studio with us at some point. That's awesome, man. Sounds like you guys got a ton of things going on. And, uh, yeah, man, Chronocord is uh, is running hard right now. I see a lot of really, really good things in the future for you guys. So just absolutely keep doing what you're doing. And uh, definitely con- continued success to you, my friend. Likewise, Invertebraker, man. I'm hoping that we can collaborate sometime on record in the near future. Um, get, a, get maybe one of our old songs that... Uh, that you and Justin worked on together, uh, get, maybe get one of those on record. I think that would be something nice to throw out there. Or uh, whether it would be one of our originals or one of your new originals. Uh, I know I can speak on behalf of Justin, saying that we definitely always look forward to collaborating with you. It's always a pleasure hanging out, um, as it was this last week down in Tampa at the Pro Wrestling Fan Fest there to oh, benefit. Yeah, we had a blast. Oh, man, that was awesome. And it was for a good cause, to benefit the uh, pro wrestling uh, memorial at the Fort Homer Hesterly Armory in Tampa, which was, of course, a historic building for the Florida Wrestling Territory, as well as music um, and many other things. So, that you know, that was fun. Always a pleasure to be here, man. I look forward to hearing... All the rest of the Phoenix Report in the near future, hearing uh, all your guests who come on, and maybe even stopping by one more time sometime soon. Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely, I'll definitely have you back on doing something. You know, know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a long interview like this, but, I mean, I'm sure we're only scratching the surface of stuff we could talk about, and I'm sure sure I'll be on some of yours as well, so it's... uh, this definitely isn't the isn't the end to this story by any means, but uh, but I think we're going to wrap it up here. Corey, thank you so much for being my first guest, and uh, and I hope I uh, hope I did a good job of interviewing you. I hope all of you listening out there, I hope I wasn't too boring, and hope I didn't stutter too much over my questions. And uh, this is fun, man. Thank you for thank you for inspiring me to do this in the first place. Yeah, man. Thank you. Uh, that's definitely something cool to hear. And uh, like I said, I look forward to coming on again, and I look forward to listening to everything you got going right here. Absolutely, man. Corey, thank you so much, and uh, I will definitely have you on here again. I'll catch you down the road, buddy. Well, there you have it, guys. Corey Wilson, my first guest, my first interview. And, well, it's not really so much of an interview, more of just a conversation between two friends. You know, we're keeping it loose and relaxed here on the Phoenix Report, and hopefully you guys... Hopefully you guys like that. So I couldn't have gotten a better first guest to be on here. Corey is just one of my best friends, and he and I go back a long ways, and I'm sure you will be hearing from him again. So go ahead and make sure you check out everything that Corey and Justin are doing on chronocord.com, and make sure you follow me on Twitter at JackXConnor, and like me on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash music. Also, feel free to check out my band at www.vertebraker.net. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, make sure you email me at jackconnorpodcast at gmail.com or tweet me with the hashtag PhoenixReport. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, You know, like I said before, I'll have some more guests, some more topics, and uh, I'll always have something interesting to talk about. 
And I hope you guys just keep tuning in and uh, keep taking this journey with me. All right. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day.